Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Georg Fischer. He is an economist employed by the European Commission. Mr. Fisher is currently at Yale as a European Union Visiting Fellow at the Macmillan Center. He is doing research on the role of social and employment policy for a functioning economic and monetary union. In June, he will return to the European Commission in his new role as Director for Social Policies. Today we talk with Mr. Fisher about the debate on economic convergence and divergence in the European Union. Welcome, Mr. Fisher. Good morning. Let's start with the terminology, convergence, divergence. What do they mean? It's, a <coughs> it's an interesting question. Uh, I just start with reminding myself, not you, because you might not have heard of these reports, but a week ago a report came out by the Bank of Spain, which is a serious institution, normally not very emotional. And they called the report the unbearable divergence of unemployment in Europe. And what does that mean? Let me just come. And okay. five years ago, there was another report. There was a report by the World Bank with the title Golden Growth. And they had this, uh, the main message of the report was the European Union is a convergence machine. Mm -hmm. So something happened in between, right. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> 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 from the convergence yes. machine to the unbearable divergence in unemployment. Uh, and it's true, a lot happened in between. But let, I would like to start a bit with the background. Okay. The European Union, 28 member states. We, it's not like the United States. I mean, the United States are together. together. The right. European Union countries decide to join, and they have reasons why they join. And one of the reasons is that they feel they would like to have social cohesion, social coherence, they would like to have economic coherence and economic uh, cohesion. And therefore, of course, one looks carefully what is happening to the different parts. Mm -hmm. And this is what divergence and convergence is about. It's not just about whether unemployment is high or low in the European Union in total. We know it used to be low, now it came high in the crisis. Mm -hmm. Now it's sort of going back up slowly. It's about what is happening in the different parts. Mm -hmm. This means this is the idea of divergence. And the different parts meaning the different countries? The countries, also group of countries. I mean, it could be, you could look at it by country. You mm -hmm. could look at it south, north, east, west, uh, richer countries, poorer countries. There are different sort of levels on which one could look into this. Mm -hmm. but. At the moment, the big issue is South-North. Okay. And, and South-North meaning which yeah. would be the countries in the South? And which south would, be, would be South would start in Portugal and then in Greece with okay. Spain and, and, and Italy in between and then some smaller countries. Mm -hmm. uh, north would be actually more the center of Europe. Germany. Okay. France. For Germany, the Benelux, France and sort of the northern European countries. Okay. And just to illustrate, not with numbers, but just to describe a little bit, in the mid-1990s, when the so-called single market process set in fully, we opened totally all, all product and service markets for each other products. Uh, we opened also the, the movement of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a bit later, the single currency came in, the euro, sure. which, only, which affects only 19 out of the 28 countries. But I mean, the other, except the United Kingdom, all the big countries are in the, in the, in the currency area. Uh, the Eastern Europeans are a bit, they will join a bit later. Some of them have already joined, some will do later, like Poland. Uh, so in the mid-1990s, there were huge differences, I don't use divergence now, differences in unemployment, in employment, in many other social indicators between the countries. Spain had an unemployment rate of 20 percent, let's say, and Germany had maybe eight, and my own country, Austria, had five. So there was divergence. Yes. And Italy had a high unemployment rate, Portugal actually not so high, Greece had a high unemployment rate, and then over, let's say, the 10 years, the following 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, actually unemployment rates 
became much more similar. And in 2006 or in 2007, there was a moment when they were all around 7 point something percent. Mm -hmm. So this was convergence. convergence. And this was this convergence machine the World Bank had mentioned in the Golden Gloss Report. Mm -hmm. And of course, we were, I mean, we, European citizens, also the politicians and my chefs in the European Commission, everybody was very happy because it seemed this process of getting together, of opening up our markets, of opening up our labor markets, of even agreeing on a common currency has worked because we saw that actually not only unemployment declined in overall, mm -hmm but also those countries which used to have in the past high unemployment rates, or well, let's say low employment, and as I said, I just use unemployment as right. one indicator uh, because it's, it's a very prominent number and mm -hmm. everybody knows what it is basically. Uh, so we were very happy because apparently it has worked. So my but question, oh, okay. can I just say, yes, well, what happened ahead. afterwards? Uh -huh. This is now the divergence, I mean, okay. this was now the <laughs> convergence <laughs> bit. No? Now we come to the divergence bit. Okay. Then the world crisis set in. Mm -hmm. And where are we now? Now the South has an unemployment rate of almost 20%, while in the North, in the definition you asked for, Germany, very little has changed. Germany has now an unemployment rate below 5%, Austria a bit over 5%, the Netherlands 7 So little has changed there, if at all improved. Mm -hmm. But in the South, we have again this very high unemployment rates. And this is why the not very emotional Bank of Spain, I mean, the, I don't know, in the US also, they are not very emotional people, the, the, the national banks, speaks about the unbearable divergence. Okay. Right, okay. So my question yeah. is, as an economist, mm -hmm. how does one explain, you know, or in the, um, convergence, everyone is at the 7% mm -hmm. unemployment rate, and then now some are some have the same 7%, but some now have 20%. How do you explain that? How uh, does it get better, and then how does it get worse? Uh, there are, again, a very good question. I could <laughs> probably speak two hours about it. Yes, I but know. But I tried to not to do. Uh -huh. I would say there are... In a nutshell. Um, yeah, in the nutshell. Of course, there was a big recession, mm -hmm. which leads to less economic activity. So that, in a way, already makes the situation worse. And uh, But I think what the big recession did, in addition, is it was a test for how, let's say, the labor markets in different countries work, the welfare system in different countries work, mm -hmm. but also how EMU itself worked, the, Europe, the Economic and Monetary Union. Right. And the divergence is apart from being a socially very problematic phenomenon, if you have for such a long time high unemployment rates, it's also a signal that something seems not to work very well. Mm -hmm. And therefore it is so important, that it, because it indicates that apparently the same economic and monetary union, which did well in good times, if you like, mm -hmm. I mean in the period 90, uh, 99, 99, sorry, 2007, mm -hmm. when there is a deep crisis, suddenly this capacity to keep things together seems not to work anymore. Mm -hmm. And therefore there is, but it also indicates these country differences that maybe the labor market in a country where unemployment remained low and in a country where unemployment increased a lot seems not to work as well in one than in the other. And this is also true for poverty, because also poverty was increasing a lot in this country. So mm -hmm. there is a question also how the national systems of policy, of employment right. policy, of social policy making are functioning. And therefore, yeah, one has to think about both. One has to think about right. the national systems, answering your question. Mm -hmm. But one also has to think about, is there something, we use this term mm -hmm. incomplete, Right, right. With the economic and monetary union, which leads to such an explosion of, of differences. Right. So what is the EMU's role in all of this? What are they doing? Are they doing anything? No, I think that the, the European Union has already drawn a number of important conclusions. I mean, we found that 
I give you a simple example. Before the crisis, when EMUs, when the single currency started, also monetary policy was harmonized. So mm -hmm. all countries had the same low interest rates. Also countries which were used from the past to have high interest rates. Again, the Southern European countries. So suddenly credit was very cheap. The Northern European countries had what we call current account surpluses. Mm -hmm. So they their banks had to invest their money somewhere. So the money flew from the north to the south at low interest rates, which made, in a way, the boom artificially big. Mm -hmm. So some of the success of our convergence story is maybe this trends in financial markets. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the European Union reformed fairly fundamentally the system how we supervise the European banks. It was unified. There is now a unified system of supervision of European banks for the whole euro area, for all the countries which have joined the mm -hmm. euro. And that should in future help to avoid this sort of massive divergences in the financial market. Uh, another thing the European Union, and this is a bit where I, why my work comes in, is we also saw that because of the, what would a country normally do if it runs into huge economic difficulties? It such would, as Greece? Such as Greece or Spain. Or it would devaluate the currency mm -hmm. because that would give the country, at least for a certain period of time, a competitive advantage in, because it could sell its products cheaper. Mm -hmm. That is not possible in a currency union because you are bound to the euro. So you can't, right. I mean, Florida cannot Yes. Change the value of the dollar. Exactly. I mean, even if Florida is in. Thank big goodness. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm saying so. It's not yes, I, so the I same understand. in the Euro. It's the same. I mean, there are still countries, but they've lost their sovereignty mm -hmm. over the currency. So they couldn't do that. And anyway, I mean, I'm not so sure it would have been such a good idea. But this is something they've lost. And the second thing they've lost a little bit is what we call fiscal policy, the budget. Because of course there are restrict of course there are restrictions in the currency union because everybody has to the currency mm -hmm. area as a whole cannot afford to have a too high debt level in the world. Mm -hmm. So basically the say and for that reason many people, including me, argue that a currency area would need also a much bigger fiscal capacity at the level of the euro area. For the moment, all the, the budget the European Union has is 1% of the GDP of the European Union, which mm -hmm. is quite small. And it doesn't adjust to the cyclical circumstances. I mean, this 1% is there all the time. So if the economy is in difficulties, at least this is what economists believe, the public sector should spend more mm -hmm. to compensate. And if the economy is doing well, it should actually spend less in order to reduce the size of the boom and also to save money when it's mm -hmm. possible. Uh, this possibility doesn't exist for the, Euro, for the Euro area. So how do you uh, fix that? There is now a huge debate about establishing something which is called fiscal stabilizers at the Euro, a at the Euro area level. Mm -hmm. And this is an area where the United States are, of course, an interesting example for us. Okay. So do you want to talk a little bit um, about the um, work you're doing here that will hopefully translate back to the EU? Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned this point already. The United States does not have a huge, I mean, it's, if I compare the wealth, the size of the welfare state of social policies between the United States and many European countries, European countries have bigger welfare states. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know this. I mean, this is not a great, that is not particularly new. But what we saw is that the US managed quite successfully to increase typical social policy expenditures like unemployment benefit, like whatever the EITC is. I mean, this tax credit for working, mm -hmm. uh, for low income workers, uh, the food stamps, which is now called SNAP. Okay. So this type of programs, the U.S. increased quite a lot in the recession. And what does it do? 
it helps the ordinary people who have low income or might have lost their jobs or might not have lost their jobs but have less hours to work or had to accept a wage cut mm -hmm. to keep their consumption level. And that helps in a recession to keep the economy going. Mm -hmm. And this option does not exist simply at the European really? Union. No, it, because we have left the, fit the responsibility and, the, and we call this subsidiarity. I mean, we have left this with the member states. And of course, uh, and the problem is, and this is sort of the catch-22 here, those member states that would need to do this most who are most affected by the mm -hmm. crisis, like Spain or Italy, uh, couldn't do it because they were already in debt. Mm -hmm. So there is a need for some sort of adjustment mechanism at the euro area level. And this is something I'm looking at. Right. How does the United States organize this adjustment? Uh, interesting. Yeah. So let me understand. So in European countries across the board, you do not, um, if someone loses their job, okay, has no more work, they don't get paid unemployment? Oh, yeah, they get. They, no, they no. do get unemployment? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The national systems exist. Okay. But what happens is if the national system, which might be more generous than the U.S., I mean, this is now not my question whether it's okay. more or less generous, the national system exists, then the country moves into high unemployment. The country is also forced to cut back on expenditure mm -hmm. because they have less tax revenue. So. so what they might do, they might do at the wrong moment the cutting back of also social benefits. I see. And this was interesting in the United States. The United States actually managed to increase this type of benefits because people needed it more. Mm -hmm. And this has, as I said, this has nothing to do with whether they receive, of course they receive unemployment. And in fact, unemployment benefit systems in Europe are mm -hmm. usually more generous than the US system. But in terms of impact on the short-term impact on growth, it's more important how it changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a general system, but then you have to cut it back, it still, it still reduces demand in your domestic economy. Right, okay. And so, Therefore, there is this idea that one would need m to move to a European complement, not replacing the national systems, but a system that would help in bad times the European, the members of the currency union to keep up a certain level of, mm -hmm. for example, welfare. Or mm -hmm. So. So just um, so I make sure I'm understanding correctly, we'll use the, in the example of Greece, who okay. has a very high level of unemployment at okay. this point. So you're saying that in addition to the national EU program, that also be getting money from Greece itself? Or no? I'm not understanding that correctly. No, I would say the Greek example is complicated for other <laughs> reasons. Let's use Spain for okay. the moment. I mean, Spain went into this deep recession mm -hmm. for a long time. Unemployment increased. They, were, they have an unemployment benefit system, which, mm -hmm. is, which we could discuss a bit later, because this is also part of the EMU thinking that mm -hmm. one would maybe also think about how the national systems work. And I mentioned this before. It's not only an issue of EMU, it's also how do the national systems work. Uh, so people receive unemployment benefit for a year, but then they stay unemployed. But then unemployment benefit is expired. I mean, right. you, you okay. only get it for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Just like in this country. Yeah, like in this country. So I think in this you only get it for six months. I mean, and this then is it, but then <laughs> they do, I think, extend exactly. it. Now yes. you come to, and this is interesting, because then in the United States, there is a possibility, and this is paid by the states, the unemployment benefit the first six months, and even in the United States. But then when unemployment remains very high in this specific state, or in the whole US, the federal government comes in and helps, if you like, see, right. to continue to pay unemployment benefit. Mm -hmm. And such a system we don't have. So in Spain, ah, okay. in Spain, there are, they, they also cut a little bit back in their welfare systems. But the main thing was if you are unemployed for a long time, 
and then they receive only social assistance, which is much lower and much more difficult. So that is an interesting model. I'm not saying we are going to copy the US system, mm -hmm. but it is this extension of unemployment benefit, and then there's also emergency unemployment benefit, mm -hmm. which are, I think the extension is half of it is paid by the federal government. The emergency benefit is fully paid by the federal government, allows the Spanish worker has lost the job mm -hmm. to continue to receive at least a certain element of income replacement, which will help him to consume and which will help the economy to, to go back, right. to recover at some moment. Yes. Let me just add another point before I, I don't want to be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is also an important point and there is also a discussion in, in the European Union and they hope also to learn a little bit from the US, or at least to understand how the United States do these things. Uh, the, as I said, the welfare systems, the unemployment benefit, the labor market systems also function differently between the different countries. Mm -hmm. the, when the recession came in, the decline of economic activity in Germany which is very dependent on exports, was actually bigger than in Spain. Mm -hmm. I think in Germany, GDP declined by 6% in Spain by 5 I mean, it's both very big. Mm -hmm. But the decline in employment in Spain was twice as big as in Germany. And the decline of youth employment was something like 25% in mm -hmm. Spain and maybe 5% in Germany. And I'm not saying everybody should do it like Germany, but just to illustrate the numbers. Sure. Uh, there is a difference in how the labor market reacts. I mean, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can't be the same. I mean, if you have in one country the youth unemployment declining by one quota, and in the other country the impact on youth, on youth employment is not very big, there must be some difference in the way. Uh, and this can be explained, and this is what labor market economists do, they try to understand how the system works and how the unemployment benefit system works and mm -hmm. how the labor law works and how the... But it's not only that, those are how employers react. And there, there is increasingly a feeling that in the, in the euro area, in the currency union, labor market should become more similar. Not the same, because of course there are national histories and mm -hmm. traditions and culture and the economic structure is different, but these huge discrepancies in, for example, reaction to a shock mm -hmm. is something where, which is maybe not so good. And therefore, the, the new European Commission has launched an exercise, it's called benchmarking of policies. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to compare the policies <coughs> of different countries uh -huh. and to see, so where is the better performance? What mm -hmm. could one learn from each other? And where maybe the Sp Spain or Germany or Austria or the Netherlands or Greece need to change in order to prevent these huge divergences from happening. Mm -hmm. So this is a second element. It's not just to say we need automatic stabilizers and then everything will be fine. We also need to change how our labor markets work, how our welfare systems work, how our tax system works, how our product markets, I mean, there's mm -hmm. a long list of things. It seems extremely complicated giving, given the number of players yeah. that there are so many variables, it seems almost impossible to get it all figured out, no? I mean... But I guess you have to keep trying. No, no, I think <laughs> it's, it's, you are right, and I'm sorry to say this, but you're also, I mean, there are many players, but maybe they all have the same interest. I mean, they would like, mm -hmm. I mean, if the Bank of Spain, the National Bank of Spain, I mean, the Federal Reserve of Spain says this is unbearable, mm -hmm. I mean, there is maybe a general interest to get this right. Mm -hmm. So. But you are right also in a sense that there are many players and there are in particular those who think we did well and why should we pay for the others. Yes. And those who, <laughs> who think we need support and so on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and this makes it so complicated because, and there you are right, we know that things would get better, <coughs> I'm sorry, That's things okay. would get better if we 
reform our systems and if we had a, mm -hmm. a bigger EU budget at the level of the euro area, mm -hmm. but <coughs> some of those will say we don't like this because this would mean we would need to pay more mm -hmm. and the others are lazy and right. so on. Yes. So, and there is a bit of a catch-22 here as well. So the only way to address this <coughs> is by working together I mean, and finding mm -hmm. solutions together. And this is what the European Union, I think this is the, the thing the European Union can do best. I mean, mm -hmm. in an endless struggle, yes. or what looks like an endless struggle, to find different views and from mm -hmm. different views, have huge debates and then come up with something yeah. which is more or less acceptable to everybody. I mean, the, the Commission doesn't think this will be achieved by tomorrow. I mean, they have right. a three-stage plan, so they want to achieve by 2017 a first step and by 2020 a next step. And the idea is if we can make more progress on, let's say, the convergence of how labor markets and welfare systems function, then it will be easier also or more acceptable for the populations mm -hmm. to pay more into the common budget. Right. You see, I mean, it's <coughs> they will say, as it is now, we will pay forever for Greece, Spain, or somebody. But in reality, if one goes back 20 years ago, Germany had quite high unemployment. So, But of course, everybody has forgotten. Right. Everyone's looking at today. Uh, Forget looking about at the today. past. So they will probably, uh, there, there will be a moment when you establish such systems that also country X or Y will benefit from it. But it is probably true that, then that one needs to build more trust. And <coughs> that building the trust would mean that all countries accept that they also have to make changes to their national system. Mm -hmm. So it is an interaction. It's not just doing things at the euro area level will solve everything. This is the last thing I would say. Mm -hmm. It is an interaction between changing policy at national level and establishing right. sort of new instruments at the euro area level. Mm -hmm. Now let's throw the refugee situation into the mix. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Make it easier. <laughs> yeah? um, what do you think um, is going to happen with the huge fluc influx of refugees coming into the countries of the European Union, especially in terms of labor? And Again, I, I don't want to, I mean, I like to quote things. So there mm -hmm. were two articles. There was one, Standard & Poor, apparently yesterday uh, had a forecast saying that this will make the European Union totally unstable and therefore predicting a sort of financial crisis. Mm -hmm. so. While BlackRock, you know, the investment fund, mm -hmm. said we have to revise upwards all our projections because all these young people who will come to Europe will work hard and therefore Europe will do much better economically. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this is what the, right, right. What the financial markets so say to us. Um, so so you have everything, spectrum, I mean, you, exactly. have every, you have a wide spectrum. Yes. I think both slightly overdo and I mean, I think mm -hmm. there's, I don't think the, the inflows of refugees really endangers the functioning of the European Union. Mm -hmm. But it is a big challenge. It, it is a bit a test. I mean, I don't want to compare it, but in a way, like the big crisis was a test for our, for the way how we had organized the monetary union mm -hmm. and how we had organized our welfare systems and we need to adjust now, or we have adjusted, but need to further adjust. In a way, the, the inflows of refugees, of course, also question some of our nicely established systems, sure. like what is called Dublin and Schengen and, I mean, all these names we have. I mean, if they're really tested, I mean, this is what is happening. If there is a test, you see also where it's functioning not so well. I right. mean, this is, I'm not personally not so worried about this, but clearly we have an issue. We have an issue with the, with the external borders. I mean, people feel in Europe that the external borders are not controlled, mm -hmm. and therefore they would like to see more control. And probably the only way to do this is to have more European Act more European action on this level. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's countries, for one country, it might be simply too much to, mm -hmm. to, to control a big border like Greece or Italy. 
Uh, and this is why the European Commission yesterday proposed a sort of European board of force, European Coast Guard and board of force. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, I, I think it's only good. I mean, I'm not saying it's only good for you, but these are, I mean, we have humanitarian obligations anyway, mm -hmm. but also it's a good thing. I mean, it mixes Europe a bit more. It will increase diversity. Mm -hmm. And it is true that we are aging societies, so maybe younger people who are more mobile, more also flexible, might not be a bad thing f in the right. long run for the European economy. Uh, however, I would say I wouldn't have a high expectations in the short term. I mean, in the short term, there is a need to integrate them. Right. I mean, this is not something which, sure. which goes by itself. So there is a need to integrate, and that will cost money, and that will... But I just see this in Germany and in Austria, the two countries I know best. I mean, there, there is a feeling that people are in a way very enthusiastic about helping them. Mm -hmm. So suddenly we see we can do things with the social services are over demanded, health services, are, but suddenly people volunteer and help. And so in the combination of, of public services and, and people who volunteer, a lot is happening. Mm -hmm. And that might also be a starting point for for example, expanding some social services which need to be expanded anyway. Right. We saw without refugees. So it might turn into a positive process, but I wouldn't agree with BlackRock that tomorrow you will see. A right. I mean, I would certainly disagree with Standard & Poor, but I would not expect tomorrow a huge mm. increase in, in economic growth in, in Europe. But I think in the long run there is a point well whatever, I mean, in a couple of years, one will see the benefits from it. Mm -hmm. And I think basically it's very much in our own hands whether we see the benefits. I mean, if we provide language training, if we do those things, we provide housing, we provide social services, health services, things will go faster than if we don't. Right. So, and my feeling is that this is slowly understood. It's a, and given that civil society is quite enthusiastic. I, mean, I saw these pictures of Canada, but we had the same recently when Trudeau said he would mm -hmm. yes. take in 20,000 yes. refugees, which of course is a big number, but not very big compared to 400,000 in the third quarter in Europe. But it's still a big number. But there was also a certain degree of enthusiasm in the population and people try like to help. I think it's basically <laughs> It's not so complicated. <laughs> I mean, they like to help. Yes, people do like to help, but then you look at uh, the United States, for in instance, and, you know, we're not, you know, many states are saying, no, we don't want to take any of the refugees, um, mainly out of fear, I would imagine. Um, so, you know, it is interesting when, when you do see countries stepping up to the plate. True. I mean, the fear is there. The fear is... I think needs to be taken serious. I mean, you cannot mm -hmm. ignore it. I mean, right. you cannot say there is no security. Of course, there are security mm -hmm. issues, and and I think to, s to give people the feeling that things are under control is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a U.S. issue because you are surrounded by by water. So I mean, mm -hmm. it's uh, I don't totally understand your governors who say I don't because right. these people who come would probably be vetted 15 times. So I mean, there would be no risks, no? Well, I would imagine they're responding to media reports. Yeah, more like this. So. But, but f of course, for Europe, there is an issue of we don't know exactly who is coming in and so on. Yes. So I think that is that needs to be addressed, and therefore I think the Commission made this proposal yesterday to say we need to strengthen our external border. But, yeah, fear is there, but, I mean, uh, what can you do with fear? I mean, you can turn it into something productive, or you... Not, or not, I mean, right. and I, I think there's a good chance that they, at least in Europe, they do, and I think in Canada they do as well. Why shouldn't the U.S.? Right. So, in the time you've spent at <laughs> Yale, you'll be here for several months. Huh? Um, when you go back um, in your new role um, in the European Commission, what do you hope to accomplish, you know, after what you've learned here, and what, what, what will be some of your goals? Okay, I, I two answers. <laughs> sorry, two answers to this. Uh, I think what 
what I would like to do with the things I learn here is basically to impact on the policy design of what is probably a long-term process and on the completing the economic and monetary union and mm -hmm. sort of trying to think about the different ways how the U.S. is doing similar things and not to copy them because clearly there are two different mm -hmm. worlds. I mean, there's Europe the, and the U.S., they have a different history. These are 28 independent states. I mean, yes. these are this is a one country which is country, together yeah. for a very long time. Mm. I mean, but still, the elements one can one can learn, and this will, this is what I would like to do to bring my experience in. Uh, in my job as a director for social policy, I mean, th there will be a lot of day-to-day -day work, and I can give you two examples if you like uh, to sure. see that we're also doing a bit more practical things, not only thinking about the big Picture, design. Yeah. Uh, while I am here, my colleagues in Brussels, they are launching two public consultations on two issues where there is an agreement that the European Union should be active. And one might interest the U.S. because it's also an issue of great debate in the U.S. It's about maternity leave and parental oh, leave. Okay. And they, we have in the European Union legislation that obliges all member states to provide, I mean, through the employers or through mm -hmm. funding systems, 14 weeks maternity, paid maternity leave. Mm -hmm. and that's interesting because you exactly have now this debate, should there be paid maternity leave or not in the United States. And these 14 weeks are there, and at some stage it was proposed to increase it to 16 or 18 or 20, and not much progress was made on this. And mm -hmm. now basically I think they rightly said, well, maybe it's not about increasing, it's about effective reconciliation of work and... and it's about what? Effective reconciliation of work and family life. Okay. And just by adding another two weeks or adding another four weeks, will that really change the way how women and men treat each other and mm -hmm. how m women and men act in the labor market? So like, the attempt is now not to say we need to increase it, of course, employers say we don't have the money, we don't want to pay for right. it. I mean, 14 weeks is enough, and so on. In the U.S., they have zero, so I mean, we have to compete with the United mm -hmm. States, and so Therefore, we would welcome if you would introduce some. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the, so the question now is, don't we need to do other things? Don't we need to have more childcare? Don't we need to also help member states to have more childcare? Mm -hmm. And how can we change the attitudes of men and women? And there is one question always, in this, particularly in the parental leave, which follows to the maternity leave, uh, how men and women share. Mm -hmm. And how can one make sure that they share more than they do now? Mm -hmm. We have most member states, I think all member states have provisions that part of the parental leave is shared, but some do. I mean, in Netherlands is a high share of the yes. people, but in some countries it's, zero, it's almost zero. So, right. so how, what can we... So this is one activity my colleagues have started. They have launched a consultation, notably mm -hmm. with the social part. So they're doing research? No, they are no. basically, no, we have launched a consultation. So we will see what the different parts of society ah, I see. think about it. And this is very much addressed to employers and trade mm -hmm. union and labor unions. Okay. So we will see whether they are interested, they find this important and what, because we would of course prefer that the employers and the labor unions come up with a proposal mm -hmm. because they know in a way best. Right. I mean, they know what companies can afford. They know what workers need. Mm -hmm. They might need a bit push on the women's side because mm -hmm. women might be underrepresented in both. But I mean, the... So would you be, for instance, polling the actual workers to see what, would, what they would want most? We could for do instance. that. I that we would do in the next phase. Okay. <laughs> in the first phase. <laughs> because I think that's an important phase to know what the people want oh versus yeah, what the companies want. True. That is the next phase. In the mm -hmm. next phase, we will go out. Yeah. And, but first, we would like to see what do the main, among the many actors, what are the main mm -hmm. partners in this thinking? What right. do the labor unions think? What do the, and are they able, because we don't only ask them to give us their opinion, we also want to know whether they can do something together. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a, it goes a bit further. It's not just to say, tell us what you want. And the labor union said, we want to have 20 weeks and, mm -hmm. and pay child care by the employer. And the employer said, we can do nothing <laughs> because right, we, have yes, no we have no money. No, we want them to come to sit together and see. Whether they have ideas in what directions they could do something together. Mm -hmm. And that is, and the next phase is then when we see a little bit what potential options are. Yeah, what are the people thinking? What are mm -hmm. the women's organizations? But also, what are the actual people thinking? So, the polling is a good idea. Maybe yeah. I should take yes. this <laughs> with me. Okay. So, I mean, this is one example. I don't want to spend too much time on the second example. It's a totally different area. Is uh, we would like to, we have, we are preparing the so-called Accessibility Act. And what is that? That has something to do with different types of disabilities in, in people mm -hmm. and whether they can access services, products, the telephone box doesn't, is not mm -hmm. anymore an issue, but for example, the mobile phone, is it big enough for people who don't see well? I, I mean, see. these are the... Uh, and there we do a wide public consultation. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if people are in wheelchairs, can they access yeah, the, so yeah, the, the governmental buildings they need I think need the wheelchairs kind of are more or less solved, but um, not solved, but I mean there is much more progress right. because that's basically, there are many other disabilities, like sort of the, yes. the, which are more complicated than right. that. And with the electronic world, of mm -hmm. course, it has become more complicated. I sure. Mean, I mean, we, we used to be, it used to be easier before everybody had a mobile phone. In a way, it's also, it helps to solve some of the issues, but it also needs to be accessible for everybody. Right. And there they have launched a public consultation with seeing what people would like to and what they think about the proposal we have made. The commission has made a proposal on this and we will see what what will come out of this, and this will be very concrete. When I come back, this will be much mm -hmm. further in the in the policy process. Okay. So I will need to work on this. Mm -hmm. Well, you have your work cut out for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us today and, and sharing some of your work. It was a pleasure. Very interesting. It's very enjoyable to be here, and it's also very enjoyable to discuss with you. Thank you. Yeah. For more information about Mr. Fisher, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.